الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله ارسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على دين كله ولو كره المشركون اما بعد فيا يا الاخوان والاخوات احييكم قائلا السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته ويقول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اياكم ومحدثات الامور فان كل محدثه بدع وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وعياذ بالله وخير كلام كلام الله وخير حجي حجي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم Today Friday the 7th of January 2022 the 4th of Jumadi al-Akhira 1443 With this reminder let us also be reminded that Ramadan is a little under three months away and as was the traditions of the Prophet Ali and his companions to remind each other of the coming of this blessed month and I'm reminding myself first and reminding you and I hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us to witness another Ramadan and may it be truly beneficial to us and may he subhanahu wa ta'ala find it in his infinite mercy to guide us and to help us to benefit from its many benefits. Allahumma ameen. Today inshaAllah ta'ala I will humbly remind myself and then you of a very special companion of the Prophet alayhi salatu wassalam and the intent behind choosing this particular companion it is because of his attitude in pursuing the truth and all of us should be reminded of this endeavor if we truly are aspiring of harboring the truth if we are truly ambitious of being sincere servants to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we should have that dying desire to be on the truth at all times and only if we wish such then with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we will be granted. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala find it in His infinite mercy to help us, to bless us and to motivate all of us to be on the truth until Yawm al Salman al-Farsi was an ordinary individual just like you and I, living in the midst of kufr and shirk. And he was born in the year 568, about two to three years before the birth of the Prophet in Makkah. The only difference, he was born in Persia. And he was born to a very wealthy family because his father was what is known as the Dehkan of the village, it means that the person in charge. And I guess in those days, people would acquire such a position because of their influence and their abundant wealth. So he grew up in the midst of wealth, and he was very close to his parents, especially his father, so much so that he was isolated and protected from society. And they were of the people who worship the fire, and they follow a religion called Zoroastrian. And he was so close or so dedicated to their religion that he was considered to be the flame keeper and this is the pinnacle of kufr his job was to make sure that the flame never extinguishes it stays burning all the time so that means that he was under a schedule or a program to observe this fire 24 hours and um, his father became busy with village affairs and he asked him one day to go out and overlook their affairs. So he had this one opportunity to leave home and as he was going by to take care of his uh, affairs, he passed by a Christian church. And he heard the people worshiping, he heard the noise coming from the church. So he decided to go in and inquire what they were doing. 
And like some individuals, young people, once you get taken up with something, you tend to forget what your ultimate responsibilities are. So he was sent out to do one thing, but he ended up in another place. And uh, he was so impressed with the way the people were worshipping versus his fire worshipping that he spent the rest of the day there and went back home to his father. So his father inquired from him, what was the situation? So he said, I never got to where you sent me. But I went to the Christian church. And I'm very impressed with the way they worship. And when he came with the people in the Christian church, he started to inquire about the religion of Christianity. And they told him that this religion came from Syria. And that is where most of the people or the people of Christian faith are. That's where the religion originated from. So he told his father that he had intention of switching religions. So his father said, no, those people, their religion are on nothing. So this is what you need to be on. So he was chained and isolated for them. But that did not stop him from seeking the truth because he knew what he was in was not appropriate. The Zoroastrians are people who dedicate themselves to fire worshiping. And the fire can be a good servant to you and it can be a bad servant. It depends on how you manipulate situation or it depends on how it, the situation turns out. So he sent a message to the church. And he said, if you know of any caravan or anyone who is going to Syria, please let me know. I will try to go to Syria. And this is in pursuit of the truth. It is not, not just not sitting back and accepting what you have around you and be contented with what it is. If your aspiration is to get to something, then they have to be an effort. So the church made sure they got the message back to him in his isolation. So when he got a message, he somehow fought his way and got himself free, and he ended up in Syria. So when he went to Syria, he went to the church and he asked to see the authority of the church, and they introduced him to the bishop. So he told the bishop, I would like to be in your service, and I would like to serve your church, and I want to learn more about the Christian religion. So the bishop agreed, and then he started to be close to the bishop. When the bishop died, the people came to bury him because he started to find out that the bishop was corrupt. He's asking the congregation to donate to charity and he's holding the charity. He's becoming wealthier at the expense of the people, using the church. So when he died, the people came to bury the bishop. And Salman al-Farsi told the people that this man is very wealthy, that this is what he did with your wealth. He solicited donations from you and he made himself richer. So the congregation asked that they be shown the wealth, just to be convinced. So he took them to the jars of the gold that this guy, this bishop was hoarding. And after the people realized that he was corrupt, they decided not to bury him and they stoned him. They assigned the next bishop to the church. So Salman al-Farsi worked with him very closely and he was very aesthetic. So Salman had no problem with him and subsequently after serving him a while trying to find out what the truth is, he started to serve other Christian individuals in pursuit of the truth. And then the last one he came with in Amoria, they told him that he was told that there would be a prophet from amongst the Arab who would appear and you need to come in contact with him if you want the truth. So they described Medina as being the city of palm groves. So Salman al-Farsi immediately, the little money that he had, he looked for the first Arab caravan that was going that way. He did not say, well, let me wait. I want the truth and I am in pursuit of the truth. So if you and I are in pursuit of the truth, we don't sit back and relax until we find what it is. Because you don't know what Allah has in place for you. And Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 208, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Ya ayyuha alladhina amanu dkhulu fi silmi kafa wa la tattabi'u khutuwat ash-shaytan fa innahu lakum aduwwun mubeen. O you who believe, if you and I profess to be believers, then enter into this silm, this Islam wholeheartedly and follow not the footsteps of the devil for verily he is an open enemy to you and I. And all of us know this. But yet still we act in pursuit of everything other than pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Salman al-Farsi, when he got to the Arabs and came into contact with them, he said, look, I want to go to the Palm Grove city. So they agreed to take him. He said, whatever little money I have, I'll give it to you, take me to that city. So when they reached a place called Wadi al qura they betrayed him. And they sold him to a Jewish slave master. So he worked with that Jew for a while. Then that Jew sold him to his nephew from Banu Qurayza in Medina, the Jewish tribe in Medina. And that is where he wanted to go. And with all the hurdle and all the corruption, because he was sincere, because he wanted something that Allah have that is special, Allah took him there. And he ended up in Medina in Banu Qurayza. And you know where he was? He was on top of the palm tree when his master was sitting under and the next Jewish nephew of that master came to inform this master that the man named Muhammad is coming to Medina. Look at the path. And Sulaiman, Salman is up on the palm tree doing his job as a slave. Coming from a very, very wealthy family, he did not say, let me go back to Ajayan where I came from, to Persia. I want the truth. And I'm willing to leave everything behind. And it doesn't matter who hurt me in the way. It doesn't matter who disappoint me in the way. It doesn't matter who put hurdles in my path. This is what I want. And Allah will bring me to that. So then the Jewish nephew of that Jewish slave master came to the same palm tree that, so, that Salman was on top. And he's telling his uncle that curse be unto the Aus and the Khazraj, the two other major tribes of Medina. They are preparing to welcome this man named Muhammad from Makkah to Medina. So Salman got so nervous on top of the palm tree that he almost fell down. Because that is the news that he's waiting to hear. So he hurried down from the palm tree from the top and he came down and he asked the man in front of his master, repeat the words that you said. That is how enthusiastic you and I are supposed to be about Muhammad. It is not a laser affair. We stand up, oh, what did you say? Did Muhammad say that? I don't think so. I never heard that. He didn't say that. And his Jewish master smacked him so hard on his face and he told him to go back to your job. At night, you know what he did? Because he was told before that this prophet that is coming, he does not eat from charity. He only eats from gifts that you give to him. So Salman gathered some dates and he found his way to the Prophet and he gave him these days and he said, I heard you're a righteous man. He didn't say, I heard you're a, you're a prophet. He said, I heard you're a righteous man and you have companions who are strangers to you. And you are more in need so you can have this salafah. So he stood back on the side and he saw Muhammad give all of it away to his companions and he said to party. He did not eat from it. So Salman left. He subsequently gathered some more dates and he came back to the Prophet And he said, this is a gift to you from me. The Prophet ate from it. And then he confirmed that indeed this is the Prophet they're talking about in the Palm Grove city of al Madinah. So he went to the Prophet and he accepted Islam. He accepted Islam, but he was still under the servitude of his master. He didn't say, well, I'm a Muslim now and give up the rights of whatever it is. Kufr have rights as Muslims, and if you're obligated to something, you're still obligated to establish your responsibility. For four additional years, he worked with his Jewish master. And then he came into pursuit, and that is what caused him to miss the Battle of Badr and the Battle of Uhud. Then, in the fourth year, he started to negotiate his freedom. And the slave master tell him that if you want your freedom, you have to bring 40 ounces of gold and plant me 300 date palms. So there's no way he could have done that. So the price for his freedom was way beyond his capability. He went to the Prophet and he said, this is what they want for my freedom. The Prophet solicited the date palm from his companions, his very poor companions. Some of them give 20, some give 30, some give whatever they had until he got the 300. He went with Salman himself and he said, you dig the hole and I will put the palm in the ground. 
And he did all three. And then he came back and he had a piece of gold that he had, was given from a miner. He gave it to Salman. And he said, go and buy your freedom. He got his freedom. And then in the fifth year, the Quraysh arranged an army of approximately 10,000 people to come and do what? Eliminate the Muslims. To wipe them out. Isn't that what the cry is today? Including the people who are our leaders. Let's wipe out the Muslims. They're not worth anything. Today your newscasts spend more time on talking about pets and animals than they would talk about the atrocities committed to thousands of Muslims in other places of the world. That is the sentiment of the world today and it hasn't changed from since then. The Quraysh gained the cooperation of the Jews from Khaybar and Banu Asad and Ghatafan. And the Prophet Islam had a little over one week to prepare for them. Because they were coming with this large force and this is five years after. He left them in peace in Mecca. I don't want anything. Look, I'm leaving the city. I, his companions left their wealth. They left everything behind and they migrated. And that was not enough for them. They wanted their blood and their lives. And they arranged this mass army to come and attack the Muslims without any warning. The Prophet ﷺ gathered his companions after he got news of this. And he said, this is what it is. So they were worried as to what to do. And after he was soliciting suggestions from everyone, then this Persian stood up. And this Persian said, I have a suggestion. A suggestion is, the suggestion is that we leave this area and we go in an area and we dig a ditch around ourselves called al khanda the trench. And that was not known amongst the Arabs as a warfare before. This one man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought from Persia all the way with his struggles, not having to eat, not having to travel, was traded, was sold, worked in, in slave ship. He stood up and said, this is what I have. And Muhammad Islam went with his suggestion. And in six days, they dug a ditch and Salman was the one who determined the width and the depth of it. And if you go to Medina today, a place they call Saba Masajid, that is where that incident happened. And the Prophet Islam left the city that they wanted, bring his people on the outside of the city. So they were not in pursuit of the city because he left the city. They could have gone and taken the city. All 10,000 of them and their confederates could have gone to Medina and take the city. But they're not in pursuit of your homes and where you live. They will not be contended until they dry your blood. So then they decided to follow Muhammad والسلام, where he was. And when they went, they realized that they couldn't get over to where they were standing. So every time they tried to cross the ditch and come over, they were overtaken. And that is how the Muslims defeated them. Because they got frustrated and they left. And this is an example to all of us. It doesn't matter if you as an individual or collectively. The truth will get to you individually or collectively if you and I are really interested of having the truth. If you don't have that burning desire for the truth, it will always evade you. And that is what you and I need to have. Salman al-Farsi was no one. He was about three or four years older than Muhammad So he was not a young man when the Prophet came to Medina. And he did not stop in pursuit of the truth. So much so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the world with his presence. And Allah can do that with you and I. He had no money to offer. He had no position to offer. He had no tribe to offer. No land to offer. No wealth to offer. No special education to offer. No PhD to offer. But his contribution saved the Muslim Ummah from elimination. And that is what, if you and I are sincere, 
Allah can do with our situation because Allah put that as an example for us. It was not only special for Him, it is special for everyone who have a burning desire in their heart to die on the truth. Allah will make sure that you get there before you die. And Salman al Farsi is a living example of this. And there are many other companions of similar stories and similar lifestyle and similar endings. And in the 35th year after the Hijrah, approximately year 657, Salman al-Farsi died. And when he died, he was known as the companions from amongst the Prophet ﷺ, who people were encouraged to go to for knowledge. A man who came from Persia, he was the first to translate the Quran from Arabic language to another language because he was used to translate the Quran from Arabic to Persia, to the Persian language. Salman al-Farsi was one of the few individuals in the Muslim Ummah at that time that was the source of authentic knowledge to others. So brothers and sisters, this is not beyond you and I. It is within our realm. Well, just like how you and I pursue a bachelor's degree and we pursue a PhD and we tell ourselves that we have a certificate today, you and I can do the same thing with Islam. There are many Muslims who have PhDs and can't recite the Quran. Many Muslims have, who have PhDs and they can't pray. Many Muslims who have a PhD and they don't know how to make a dua. What is the worth of this? When you die, all of this means nothing to you. And in conclusion, I need to share this piece of information. Yesterday I received a phone call from a funeral home. Uh, we would like someone here to come and make a prayer for a Muslim. Excuse me? Yeah, we want someone to come out here. The Muslim family is here. He's a physician. He died. And his wife said when he died, he would like a Muslim to come and offer a prayer for him. I thought Muslims don't come and offer prayers like that. What time? Tomorrow at 1.30. I said, well, at 1.30, most Muslims are a Juma, So they can't come to the funeral home. And I said, we offer a prayer called Salatul Janazah, which is a prayer dedicated for the deceased. And the deceased, for him and her to be prayed over, then he and she have to be washed and shrouded. Well, who will do that? I said, it's not just offering a prayer that we can ask anybody to do. So they said they will talk to the family because the wife is in charge and they will get back with me. If you don't want your affairs to be like that, brother, you and I better try and do something that will help us. Salman al-Farsi did not want to die as a fire worshiper. He want, he, his desire was to die in something that is more worthwhile. And he lived in pursuit of the truth and he did not die as an insignificant person. He's recorded in history as the man with Allah's mercy and guidance that was brought to this place to do this for the Muslim. And Allah can make you and I that individual in this part of the world. اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد. Brothers and sisters, as a reminder to myself and you, please do not give up on the massages of the earth, the houses of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This is the only place that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala dedicated as houses of mercy, and all of us need mercy. Mercy is not in the streets. 
It's not in the shopping malls. It is not the CDC. These are the places of mercy. The houses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, do not give up on this. Wa aqimu salah inna salah.